It is my true pleasure to invite to the stage the only female speaker today, Dr. Roberta Shapiro. So she is an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Rehab and Regenerative Medicine at Columbia University. And she also operates a private practice for physical medicine and rehab in New York. I was personally treated by her. She was very generous to work on one of my neck injuries <laughs> from jiu-jitsu. And since then, that pain has been gone. I feel so much better. It's really incredible when you hear about something and then you actually go through the experience and you come a different individual on the other side, which was amazing. And the theme that she's gonna talk about today is the wild west of stem cells. So you will definitely have some questions after her speech. Write them down and then we'll all gather here in a few minutes. So please welcome Dr. Roberta Shapiro. Hi. So, hi. Uh, so this is actually the first, I just want to make sure I know how to advance this. Just quick, right? Okay. This is actually the first talk I've given since COVID. Um, this was the last one I actually gave right before COVID. And so I was thinking about what we all kind of went through and faced. Yeah. Oh, years, and I, um, <laughs> I realized, scary, I realized that our lives have changed very dramatically. And so I decided when I was asked to speak again to do part two of the Wild West of Stem Cells. So I started preparing this or thinking about preparing it a couple months ago actually when I was asked. And I was really struggling with how I was going to talk and what I was going to say. And I just couldn't wrap my head around the story I wanted to tell because when I speak, I tell a story. It has to make sense to people. I just couldn't put it together. I probably went through 10 derivations of this lecture, of this talk, and I couldn't figure out why. As recent as last night, I changed it. And then this morning when I woke up, I suddenly realized, I changed it again, I suddenly realized why I was so confused. And that's because over the last few years, since I gave the original Wild West talk, I've spoken to many, many people, people in the industry who make the products, people who distribute the products, other colleagues of mine, and not a single one of them had the same answer to me about what they understood to be legal or applicable in the United States. And I thought, if I'm confused by this, imagine how patients that are trying to sift through this are confused by it. I then went back to the, the actual government sites and looked at the FDA legislation. So my talk is a little boring. I hope I'm not going to bore you too much after these great stories of football players and congestive heart failure and ejection fractions and all of that. But I want it to be understandable for us so that we can actually take it apart. The FDA is actually very clear. And it hasn't changed in the last few years since I gave the first lecture about the Wild West. They're very, very clear that any postnatal product cannot be more than what they call minimally manipulated product, period, end of story. They're also very clear that the only legal and FDA approved products, as has already been alluded uh, to us, are hematopoietic progenitor cells used for cancers, immunologic diseases, and certain blood disorders. Otherwise, none of these are, as Dr. Ozerkar just said. So um, in the past few years, in some ways, a lot has changed. In some ways, nothing has changed. Back then, I always used to say, um, I felt like I was going into battle every day when I went into my practice, and I actually still feel like I'm going into battle, only there's more of those now. Um, but I had also commented in the past about how so many people were contacting me with confusion about what to do, where to go. That actually also remains the same. And in fact, in the last few years, the number of clinics uh, offering these treatments has exponentially increased, which also adds to the confusion. And I feel like doctors have become, look, have started looking at this as the piggy bank of medicine, you know, because we know insurance is, it doesn't cover these processes and these, these procedures, as Dr. Ozakar already said, it's out of pocket. And so they see ka-ching, ka-ching dollar signs. And I think that that's a real disservice to patients. So some of the examples of what I see are non-medical offices now starting to offer stem cell cures, right? Very soon, I feel like nail salons are gonna start saying, come on in, let's do stem cells, right? 
Uh, the other thing I start to see is that these claims of giving millions and millions of live umbilical cord derived MSCs right in this country. And I, I actually have a problem with that. How do they know that? You know, we're so limited with how we can process. How do the doctors actually know what they're putting in you? Do they have the equipment in their office to do cell cytology and cell counts? Just because the rep came in and said to them, oh, there's 10 million live mesenchymal stem cells in this product. We are so limited with how we can produce them here. I don't trust that. The other thing I start to see are these clinics that, I'm gonna actually backtrack from that a second. I get uh, patients all the time that say to me, oh, I had stem cells injected into my knee for a meniscal tear or into my shoulder for rotator cuff problem. It didn't work. And I say to them, really, where, was that, where were those stem cells taken from? Excuse me. And they say, oh, it came from my blood. That's not a stem cell product. It is a useful uh, uh, product to use in certain situations, particularly if you can access amazing clinics like RMI, where they're the Reardon Medical Institute, where they're looking at and combining all of these things, but it is not actually a stem cell procedure. It basically, as, as it says, platelet-rich plasma, it's a concentration of platelets in the plasma that utilize certain growth factors that promote regeneration, but it's not actually a mesenchymal stem cell uh, procedure. What has changed, however, over the last few years is that doctors are much more open now to learning about this. They no longer look at me like I'm a charlatan peddling snake oil. And that's, you know, that to me is a huge, huge change. The other thing is that the science is also advancing in very, very exciting ways. I get articles sent to me all the time by patients and by colleagues in, in journals about stem cells, gene therapies, uh, targeted immunotherapies, things that are happening right here in the U.S. under clinical trials, but those are not accessible to the normal person like you and I. And so that's what I'm trying to sort out right now, what is. Again, we talk about inflammation. Well, I have been harping on this for 30 years. I have been saying inflammation is the underlying source of all disease processes. I call aging a disease because of the inflammatory reactions. All of these things we see up here, thyroid disease, heart issues, diabetes, and we can go on and on, are based in the, in, the, in the inflammatory changes that occur in our bodies, the changes in our skin, in our hair, in our nails, everything. Also, neuropathies, which we're starting to hear a lot more about, and not just the traditional diabetic peripheral neuropathies where there's numbness, tingling, pain in the hands and feet, but we're starting to actually understand neuropathies on a deeper level, and that they can affect multiple organ systems, gastrointestinal tract, heart issues, pulmonary issues, these can also be part of neuropathies. So, you know, I, I feel very, very, very strongly about how we treat these systemic disorders, which are limited in this country, which I'm gonna to get to in just a minute. The typical treatments, we know that, it's already been talked about, that non-steroidals, the steroids, the muscle relaxant, the opioids, neuropathic mediating agents, most patients come to me, they're already on Neurontin or Lyrica for their neuropathy, and we could go on and on. You know, the injectables, off-the-shelf biologics, Enbrel, Humira, which affect the immune system. None of these are magic. There is no magic, there no, is no miracle. So I wanna look at the alternatives right now and take it down to a very basic level, terms that you've been hearing so far already, thrown around all over the place. I actually want to give you a slightly better understanding. And so I, I look at it as a hierarchy of regenerative medicine from the very basic to the more advanced. So the first thing we look at are products from our own bodies or autologous that you've, as I said, heard about repeatedly. Those are, as I said, blood or PRP, fat derived or adipose, and bone marrow derived cells. So when we look at PRP, I've already described to you that it's utilizing the growth factors. PRP might actually be a good option for a very young, healthy person that comes into my office with a simple sprain or strain. That's easy, you can do it right there. It's not expensive, you extract blood, spin it down, re-inject it, and they're very young and they have more concentrated growth factors. Also, it has the benefit, like all of these do, of being from your own body, so there's no potential for a negative immunologic response. So what about fat, fat-derived MSCs? In fact, fat 
is the most plentiful source of mesenchymal or mesenchymal stem cells in our body. Um, the problem is we have to then start to think about the age of the patient. We already heard people say that as we get older, we have an attrition rate, our our we have fewer cells. And there's this great chart that Dr. Kaplan, Arnold Kaplan, uh, published, which uh, we've talked about already, but I like to actually look at it because you can see that he says, and this is accurate currently still, you have about one mesenchymal stem cell at birth to about 10,000 bone marrow cells. By the time a person is 80 years old, they have one mesenchymal stem cell for approximately 2 million bone marrow cells. And you can see the biggest time of degradation is actually from birth to our teen years. That's the biggest drop. That's quite dramatic. So when I'm looking at choosing an autologous product that I can use th with a ton of limitations in this country, I'm always thinking about that. And when I think about fat, because that's what we're talking about, that's what it looks like. That's gross, okay? <laughs> I, we extract that from people, and it's ugly. It's thick, it's gunky, it sticks together, it clumps together. And then I expect that product through one fancy centri centrifugation process in 30 or 40 minutes. It looks a lot cleaner by the time you're done centrifuging it, but do I expect that product to really be clean enough and safe enough for me to administer intravenously in all patients and prevent a possible fat embolism from occurring? I don't know. You know, I'm not, I'm not brave enough to take that chance when I know there are alternatives. There was a review done in 2017 by some Danish researchers, which I used last time I gave this talk, and it's still accurate. It still tells a story. They reviewed over 70, stu 70 studies, over 1,400 patients, all who had received adipose or fat-derived mesenchymal stem cells, and they were looking for three potential uh, adverse reactions, one of them uh, immunologic, one cancer or oncologic, and thromboembolic. Obviously, immunologic was not an issue, again, product from your own body. As far as cancer, there was one case of recurrence of breast cancer 12 months, within 12 months after the treatment, but you can't really statistically relate that to the treatment. It's actually lower than the general population of, of cancer patients anyway. There were, however, embolic events, thromboembolic events that resulted in stroke and death. Now they, now that, that's a big adverse reaction to me. Um, they did overall say that it was quote safe, but again, I'm not willing to take that chance with my patients' lives. Again, as I said, most of the fat is being pushed for intravenous application. And I completely understand that. Because, you know, we're talking about the fun stuff like spine and, you know, meniscal tear or rotator cuff tear. But most of us suffer from these more serious, advanced, systemic, and sometimes age-related diseases where we do require intravenous application for that systemic effect. So I understand why you would push towards IV. I just don't think that the way we're allowed legislatively to do it in this country with same-day procedures is safe yet. What's very frustrating for me, though, is that we actually have the technology to do this the right way. We have the technology to extract this product, send it to a proper lab where they can actually uh, sift out and isolate the most robust cells and then grow or expand, culture those cells into a larger population and then send it back to the doctor for application back to that patient. But we have these constraints with our government at this point. That, that is changing and I hope sooner rather than later. I used to say 10 years. Guess what, it's 10 years later, and I'm still saying 10 years, so I don't know. Um, and the third autologous that I mentioned is bone marrow, bone marrow aspirate or BMAC. Bone marrow also has a reasonable concentration of mesenchymal stem cells as well as hematopoietic stem cells. Again, we have to take into consideration the age of the patient and that attrition rate of the absolute number of cells. And again, we're spinning it down in one process the same day. We don't really know what we're putting back in that person because we have to re-deliver it the same day. So unless we're doing automatic cell cytology right there where we see how many of the cells survived that centrifugation process and what cells they are, we're just basically putting packed cells back into somebody hoping that that's gonna work. 
This actually is useful intraoperatively, and there are a growing number of orthopedists that are doing this when they're doing surgery on a knee or a shoulder. At the beginning of the surgery, they extract bone marrow. They have it processing while they're doing the repair on whatever joint or tendon structure or cartilage structure that they're treating. And then they infuse that spun product, those packed cells, back into the surgical site, which I think definitely speeds up healing time and limits or minimizes some of the post-surgery um, pain. But imagine, imagine what I said before, if any of us could, in my office, if I could extract the fatter bone marrow, as I said, send it off to a proper lab for proper processing, have it sent back to me where we could apply it intravenously safely for patients, intramuscularly, intraarticularly, or perioperatively, you know, that is where we have to land at some point. The bottom line is, I just don't think we are there yet. And so then we move on along that hierarchy. You're not sleeping yet, are you? I hope not. Uh, I'm trying to be as exciting as I can about this. We, we move on to allogeneic, those products from other bodies, which is where we're starting to talk about the need for places like Panama. And so when we talk about allogeneic products, we actually are allowed to process in this country umbilical cords, umbilical cord blood, uh, amniotic tissue and placental tissue. We're just under tremendous constraints and restrictions on how we process these. I said in the very beginning, the FDA is very clear, no more than minimal manipulation of these biologic agents, and they are not, as was already said, FDA approved. There are ways around this to do something called an IND or IRB protocol, where you apply to the government for approval for a study or a clinical trial. The problem with that in this country is that a lot of doctors or clinics apply for these IRBs. If they get approval, they then sell their protocols to clinics around the country who then in turn consider it a multi-center trial. They sell it to patients as though it's FDA sanctioned or approved, and then patients pay a fortune for those treatments. Well, I'm sorry, but something that is experimental and research, if it really is, we shouldn't have to pay for, should we? And so I am always saying, beware of what I call patient-funded studies, whether they're allogeneic or autologous. They are not, they are not FDA approved. And the problem in this country, even if those treatments are safe, I don't have oversight over where that product is coming from and the lab in this country unless I physically go and visit that lab and, and vet the processing, which I do do. So with respect to these allogeneic products, any lab can open up uh, a, a cell processing facility. All they have to do is register with the FDA. That doesn't mean they have been approved by the FDA or vetted by the FDA. So then these middlemen come in and they start selling the products to doctors as their, their own. It's basically white labeling it. When I gave this talk last time, there were about 800 facilities in the country that sell, sold these stem cell products. As of March of 2021, it was counted at 1480. That's two years ago. There are many more now. And again, the FDA may not have complete oversight over the biologic, but they do have oversight over the lab. And if this lab is registering, why can't they also be vetted before they're allowed to sell their product? Is that too much to ask for? I don't really think so. Uh, and that's what I actually just said. And so that, you know, that problem is, that it, the problem with that is that we then have a lab that we don't know the quality of the product, and then ill-informed doctors that are jumping all over the dollar signs or wanting to really help patients and do advanced things, but perhaps don't know enough about how to vet the products. So this is what an actual proper lab should look like. I used this next slide on my last talk because this is what I fear they actually look like. Um, uh, obviously a little bit of an exaggeration. So then how do I assess the quality of these products. I go through a checklist in my mind. So the first thing, and actually with the facility, I want to know that those are local donors with proper screening. I want to know that the raw material is from a live cesarean section, not a vaginal delivery. I get these inserts from companies all the time that want to sell their products to me, and they send me two or three pages with microscopic print 
where they painstakingly, and I read it all with a, with a magnifier now that I'm older, although I'm getting younger because of all the stem cells I've had, um, I'm told. Uh, at least my blood looks that way. I look 10 years, I mean, I, my blood looks 10 years younger. I may not. Um, so nowhere in some of these forms does it actually say if it was from a live cesarean section or a vaginal delivery. I can't assume that it's from a cesarean section. And honestly, a vaginal port is not a sterile port. That is not a safe product to use. So that's one of the things that I'm always looking for. I'm looking at proper chain of custody of that product, literally from the operating room cesarean section to the lab and throughout all the processing in the lab. I'm looking at the lab, that, that the lab is at GMP or good manufacturing uh, um, standards or above, and hopefully has been seen and vetted by the FDA. I'm looking for adequate temperature and sterility controlled storage areas. I'm looking that the lab sends out at least one sample of all of their batches for outside testing, third party testing, in case there's internal bias or an infectious process. There were cases a few years ago that patients were getting E. coli around the country at one of these multi-center trials, right? Finally, the FDA went into the lab and found that seven out of their 10 lines of cells were growing E. coli. So, you know, I'm always looking that they're sending them out for independent testing. And I'm also physically looking at the lab. I go there, I want to see the product, and I want to confirm the actual product components. When a lab or a cell processing facility does not let me see some of their rooms, I always wonder, what are they hiding? Right? That's me. Maybe they're not hiding anything, but why not let me see it? So what about these diseases that we're treating that we're talking about, these more diffuse, systemic, advanced diseases like the neuropathies or the, auto, the many, many, many autoimmune inflammatory diseases? We have to apply intravenous mesenchymal stem cells for this. And this, in my mind, because of where we are in the country, is what necessitates us to go outside of the country and start looking to source this in other facilities. And because of that, I continue to travel I continue to visit clinics in other countries. I feel that that's my responsibility, and I'm finishing up with this. I continue to be amazed that they cater to the American psyche. To Americans, more is better, right? Well, not so when it comes to stem cells. We know that there's a magic number of somewhere around 120 million cells infused intravenously. So when patients call me and they say, why shouldn't I go to this clinic? They're gonna give me 300 million cells and this one's gonna give me 250 million cells. I don't really care as long as it's at that magic number and I know the quality of the cell product. That's actually more important at the end of the day. The other thing I always wonder is that a lot of these programs now are infusing all the cells at once, in one sitting, rapidly. I don't understand that. The patient's there for three or four days anyway, and we know that once you surpass about 50 to 60 million cells in one infusion, the body mounts an immunologic response, and it starts to feel achy and feverish and chills and sweats and headaches. And even though that's a transient response, why do we even need to provoke it? Why don't you just split it up into three infusions and make it easier for the patient to tolerate? And then the last thing that I always wonder is I visited some of these clinics and I understand that not every clinic can uh, undertake having their own actual cell processing lab. That is a huge undertaking. It's a whole other level of expense. I get that. So these clinics are buying the cells or importing them from facilities very often thousands of miles away that are flown in under very stringent conditions to maintain the product in a deep freeze. I don't understand why some of these facilities don't have some type of mini lab set up so that they actually can evaluate that product. Why not when that product comes to them from thousands of miles away? How do we know it didn't sit on a plane in the tarmac and actually defrosted? 
by the time it came to us and some of the cells have died in the process. A mini lab could defrost the product, look at the actual cell product, validate the, the cell counts and the viability of the cells, refreeze it, and then use it for patients. So I don't actually understand that piece of it. And I'm just going to leave you because everybody else had all these great cases to talk about. So I'm going to leave you with one video of a patient of mine. Um, somebody's, I, somebody's iPhone just paired with my computer. Um, anyway, I'm going to leave you with this, and I'm going to play that video in a second. This is a patient of mine who had a car accident in October of 2019, and he's a quadriplegic. He has a C5-6 spinal cord injury. By the time he got out of rehab, he had done a lot of research and knew he wanted to pursue stem cell treatments, but all this was COVID. All the clinics were, were shut down. And so I brought him to my office where several times I infiltrated growth factors around the adjacent to the actual level of spinal cord injury and multiple muscles below the spinal cord injury to try to maintain the bulk and the strength because obviously you atrophy very quickly. Um, he has now actually just this past week completed his fifth treatment in Panama where he got intravenous, intrathecal, and intramuscular uh, injections. And I know you're, you'll look at this and say, well, you know, he's held up by all of this equipment, but please understand this is a man who is a quadriplegic who had no movement below some deltoid C5-6 innervated muscles into his forearms. He is activating God, I cry every time I see him. Um, he's activating muscles far below where he had a spinal cord injury. And he understands, he's very practical and realistic. He understands he's not gonna be a community ambulator. He just wants a certain level of independence. This man, two and a half years out of his injury, has no muscle atrophy because of what he's been doing. And the visit before this one, he was sitting in the treatment room waiting to get his first intrathecal infusion. And the interventional anesthesiologist that's been treating him walked in, he was sitting unsupported with his back to her. Quadriplegics cannot sit unsupported. She literally started crying when she saw him. And so I know that there are no miracles in this world, but this is about the closest I've ever seen to one. So thank you. <laughs>